Okay, cool. So I'm Todd Gamble and I'm from Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Who's heard of Lawrence Livermore? Who's been there? No one, okay. Livermore is in California. It's about an hour from San Francisco. It's like, I think 7,000 people these days. It's, we sort of range between six and 7,000. Um, there, it's, it's like a square mile in, in Northern California and it's been around since like 1952. Um, Livermore's mission, I guess, is maintaining the national nuclear stockpile and also doing other kinds of energy simulation. And so we have a pretty big HPC center. Um, Livermore Computing, where I work, um, is I guess about, we have 3,000 users and the organization itself is like 120 people, um, or at least in the Compute Center. And then I'm in the Research Division, which is also like another 110 people or so. So it's, it's pretty big, it, it's a cool place to work, and um, SPAC sort of came out of there. So I guess I, I'm going to give a little history of SPAC, um, where it came from in the context of the lab, and then talk about the project and, and where it's at right now. Okay. So um, SPAC has kind of different goals from EasyBuild, um, although I think a lot of them overlap. We want to facilitate experimenting with performance options, and I think that's one of the places where um, we differ uh, from, from EasyBuild, is that uh, there's a lot more experimentation in SPAC. You can do it on the command line, you can say, I want to install this way, and we'll, we'll try to do that. Um, and we, we optimize for flexibility. So we try to make it easy to um, build software in arbitrarily many configurations and have them all coexist. Um, and specifically, we want it so that the user could build something that maybe hasn't been built before. Um, and we also, you know, we want to make it easy to swap a compiler into the build, to swap MPI or LawPack or, or BLOSS implementations or really any virtual dependency. We even have things like JPEG as a virtual dependency, so you can build something with JPEG or JPEG Turbo, depending on what you wanted to play with. Um, and then also, we want to make it easy to inject compiler flags into builds. Um, Along with that, um, with that performance experimentation, we're also trying to build the things that you would need for scientific analysis. So in that sense, we overlap with things like Conda. Um, we want to have a full Python stack in stack, and also things like Jupyter Notebook um, available and easy to install. I don't know how, I don't think we're, we're quite as stable as we'd like to be there yet, um, but, but that's the goal. And we want to run on laptops, Linux, and then also the largest supercomputers. So you know, we support platforms like Cray, BlueGene. Uh, we'd really like to do ARM and um, also Mac OS. We haven't, we haven't ventured into Windows yet, although I would kind of like to just to get um, that box checked, because I think we have a lot of users who would, who would benefit from it. And um, I guess just speaking from a Livermore perspective, um, the, the lab is divided into lots of different parts, um, but we do have code teams, um, which are you know, maybe 15 people each who are you know, permanent developers and then different physicists hop on and off the code teams. Some of those guys support um, teams that use Windows and um, in other agencies across the government. And so we, we would, uh, we'd like to support them better with Windows. We just haven't gotten around to doing the support yet. Because most of our HPC is, is Linux or Mac OS, and, and where the scientists use Mac OS on their desktops. Um, it started as sort of a, a Livermore only project, um, but SPAC has grown. Um, it's used all over the world now. I got this idea from Kenneth to make one of these worldwide uh, Google Analytics charts showing the cities where it's used. Um, I don't think we generate our charts quite the same way, so I'm not sure how comparable this is to the Easy Build one. I think the main takeaway, if you've seen Kenneth's Easy Build slide, is that we have more users in the US than necessarily Europe. Um, the big circles are over here. Um, but we're growing over there, and, and if anyone wants to use back here, that would be awesome. Um, we get a lot of visits. Uh, we have over 200 contributors now. Uh, 500, I guess, clones per day. I tried to make this more digestible for, for non-developer audiences. Um, and over 2,100 software packages in SPAC. And that includes things like Python extensions and R packages and stuff like that. Um, it's supposed to be easy to install. Um, we have a lot of scientists who aren't necessarily savvy with, with Python. And so we make it so that it, if you can just say, clone it from GitHub. Um, you can source this file, although you don't even have to, um, and then you can run this back executable right out of the box. It's back install HDF5. It does have some external dependencies like curl, but we sort of expect that those will be on the, on the system. And then um, this, is where I'm, this is where the flexibility comes in. We want it to be easy for someone to install a thing um, however they want it to be. Um, basically, like if you know the name of a package, you should be able to install it with SPAC. You can say SPAC install 
say MPI leaks, that's just a tool that we develop. Um, if you know the specific version that you want, you can say install it at that version. You can add the compiler that you want to build with, the version of the compiler, different build options, flags, um, and even you know, architecture targets. And then that syntax is recursive, so you can do that to, to dependencies as well. Um, and the idea is that the user specifies what they want, um, and we go and fill in the blanks and, and fill out the rest of the spec. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, yeah, so here's a little more on the syntax. This is the unconstrained install command. You just type the name of the thing. Um, you can do versions, compilers, options. We've already been over this. You can even specify like the OS or the target. We have a um, platform model where um, we represent the, I guess the architecture is really a platform, an operating system, and a target. And that's designed for platforms like Cray and BlueGene where you may have multiple operating systems or multiple targets on the system. So if you've logged into a Cray before or a BlueGene, the login nodes are running one type of Linux um, and they have one type of processor. And then the backend nodes are probably running some other operating system. On the Cray, it's Compute Node Linux. On BlueGene, it's IBM's custom Compute Node kernel. Um, and they may have a different architecture. So, and, and even on the same Cray, you might get two different architectures. So if you look at like Cori or Trinity, um, the machines at NERSC and, and Los Alamos, um, their, their login nodes are running SUSE, and I think they have Haswell login nodes, and then their back, or, or no, Broadwell login nodes, and the backend nodes are either Haswell or Xeon Phi, depending on which partition you want to run in. And so there are these large Franken machines where you may build um, packages for either side. So we don't support um, building one package for both architectures, although they, you know, they've built Linpack that way to run it on the machine, I believe. Um, but not many people run that way, so we don't really support it. You can build it for one thing. Um, and then, like I said before, you can specify your dependencies and also constrain some of them. Um, so, what does spec look like from a user perspective? Um, it looks kind of like what you'd expect. Um, if, you, if you clone it and you want to see what's available, you can just say spec list to see what packages are available. Um, it'll give you, I think, around 2,300 of them now. Um, and then this is, it, these are just names. They don't actually have the versions and things associated with them. There's one package file in spec for each of these names. Um, and then if you want to see what's installed, you use spec find. Um, and you can use, it, it, when, when you do that, what you get is you get this list. Um, and this is one way we can show it. But essentially, when we install things in the spec, we actually put the packages uh, and their metadata in a, in a database. And this is showing the different architectures um, that we've built for along with the compiler. So we organized it that way so it's just easy to get an overview. Um, and then these are the packages with their versions. Um, there's actually a whole lot of options to spec find that you can use to query the database and to see what's installed, what depends on what, what the reverse dependencies are, what the dependencies are, things like that. Um, and you'll notice here that we're just showing the versions. Um, and so like, you'll get duplicates here if you have the same thing installed two different ways where this isn't enough information to disambiguate. So you might have installed dynance twice. That's two dynance at 8.1.2. They can coexist with each other because they go into separate prefixes. Um, and uh, you can query you know, more details on them if you want. So if you say spec find call path like this, notice that there's two different versions of call path. One's built with Clang, one's built with GCC here. If you want to see more about that, like what it depends on, um, then you can do this. And this is saying, um, this is spec find dash dl call path. So the d says, show me the dependencies. The l says, show me the actual hash of those things. And, um, what you, can, and you can actually get some, some more information about you know, what exactly is different about these. You know that this one's built with Clang, this one's built with GCC, but also you can see things like this one is built with boost 1.59, and this one's built with boost 1.55. And so we actually store all that information. Um, you can even do things like query um, all the packages that are built against boost at a particular version. So you can find all the GCC versions of call path that are built against this version of boost, um, and that's a valid stack. You can construct that. So, can I, yeah. Can I answer? Sure. This is, this is SPAC. This is not mo some module database. It's this is not the module database. This is SPAC's own database. And so that we're, this is where we are storing um, the build provenance. And I'll get into what that is. Um, we also generate modules, so you can you can query the module database. I don't know that you can get all this information out of the module database. Yeah. Okay. So, how do we do this? Um, the install model for SPAC, if you're familiar with how Geeks and Nix install things, it is it is fairly similar to like the Geeks or the Nix store. Um, and what that means is that 
This is our dependency DAG here. If this is your package, this is MPI leaks. It depends on call path, dynance, libdorf, libelf, and MPI. We'll get a little bit into this later. Um, we hash that whole DAG. And so essentially, each one of these um, packages has all the metadata that I described on it. It's got its name, its version, it has um, the you know, build options that it was built with. We actually put hashes of patches on there now, so that if it was built with particular patches, that you can see a difference between one with one patch and one with another patch. Um, and we hash that whole DAG, and we install it into a directory that's defined by the hash. Um, so where we differ from Nix and Geeks is that the, the hash that they install under is content-based, and so they're actually hashing on the, the binary installation, whereas we're hashing the metadata for the install. And so this is, this is the description of what we use to build it. It's recursive, it includes all the dependencies, and so if you built it with you know, one version of Zlib or another, those are two different packages. Um, but we, um, we're hashing just the metadata, not the actual binary artifact. Um, to debate which one's better, um, you know, uh, we like it this way because it, we're, we're focused on the configuration, not necessarily the binary reproducibility down to the bits. Um, and I, I would question whether, whether you really, really care about all the bits that get installed with your package, because some are things like the date that it was built and stuff like that. Um, it, I'm, I'm more keen on the way that Debian does reproducible builds than necessarily the way that the Nix and Geeks guys do. Um, in that like the actual build, if you run it anywhere, is reproducible versus um, the whole isolated root environment and we just hash the bits that come out approach of Nix and Geeks. At any rate, um, these guys are installed to their own prefixes. And um, the thing that we do to make this work together is we ensure that all the packages are built with our paths. And so the, the libraries that get installed, they know where to find their dependencies. And so if, if I have the MPI like package in here, and it depends um, somehow on, well, these are two other packages like HDF5. But this particular MPI leaks package, suppose that the call path package was somewhere. The libraries in this directory would have our paths out to the dependencies in the other directory. And so when you run them, regardless of you know, what the user's environment looks like, um, they will load the libraries that they were built with. Um, the rationale for that is that um, we have so many support calls from users who get their LD library path wrong or that have something in their environment that is just screwing up their um, setup. And our path is nice because it's a big hammer. You can just say, no, you, you will build it this way. And um, we figure that you knew what you were doing when you built the software um, because you had to configure everything, or the package manager did. And by the time you get around to running it, you likely don't remember, you know, this is a small package, or the, you know, for some of our codes, like the 90 or so dependencies that you configured with. Um, and so we figured that embedding that in the executable is fine. Um, our pathing things is kind of like linking statically. You just save a little more space, and then um, you always run with the libraries that you build with. Um, the, we do store this kind of information in the database too. Um, we store it redundantly, so like every package um, gets the YAML file representing this DAD in its prefix, and then we also have this index of all the YAML files. The index is regeneratable, so if you if you blow away um, the if you if you remove a directory manually or something, um, then you can go and regenerate the index from what's left over, and that even is down to the things that are missing, because like the MPI leaks package will have metadata for itself and all of its dependencies, and so we can see that maybe like the libel version that was there before is missing, and we can tell you it's that find that you know these pack we'll show them in red, these packages are gone, you can't uh, you won't have those anymore, and so if you run this thing it may fail. So what they do in Nix and Geeks is run path rather than our path. Yes, and run path is like our path with stupid search semantics. Yeah. So like if you, if, have you looked at the difference? I, so it, it, it yeah. Basically if you do our path, you can still shoot yourself in the foot with LD library path. You, if you do run path, you can still shoot yourself yeah. in the foot with LD. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the, other th the only thing about run path, I, I would like run path, if, but for one thing. If the way that LD.so works is that if you, um, if you use a run path, either in the library or even in the executable, um, what it causes to happen is that the search for, for libraries will terminate at the object that you're loading. So if you, if you suppose you have a library like these guys, right? And um, libdwarf, suppose it depends on libelf, right? And you're going to load libdwarf. Um, if it doesn't have the um, run path for libelf in it, but it has other, any other run path in there, it won't bother to search the parent object for the search path for libelf. So like, there's no way to correct a broken run path after the fact. If you install a library with run path, 
and you forget something, then you build an executable and you try to um, you know, add the run paths for the missing things for this library, it'll break. Run path will never check the, the run paths from the executable. And even if you are path the executable and the library is built with a run path, the, the R paths won't be consulted because any run path in the chain breaks the search. Whereas R path, it just says, okay, I'm gonna search the paths here. So <laughs> all the way up to the executable, it just keeps searching parent objects. And so you actually get a nice layering of your, of your search path with R path. Um, they, they deprecated R path. Like ten years ago, and everyone still uses it. Yeah, but officially so, it's deprecated. Officially it's deprecated. They tell you not to use it. And we've told Red Hat that they should not. Use They're it. never going to get our path ever. Who deprecated it? Just the, 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 um, no. So there was a major flame war on the Debian mailing list. list a long time ago. Debian tilts. Sorry. The yeah, Debian tilts. Yeah. Um, but well, only recently did they actually put in the deprecation. The, the other stupid thing about our path and run path is that the way that they use the same flag on the linker line, but you put this enable new d tags flag along with it, it turns an R path into a run path. Yeah. And so a lot of the compilers that we get have started to um, put the enable new d tags on by default, which is really weird to me. Um, because, they, so here's an example, OpenMPI throughout uses run path in their, in their linking. And if you, uh, and they expect that the run script that they, that they ship with OpenMPI will include the paths for OpenMPI via LD library path. So they use run path in all their libraries, and then they expect that to be completed with LD library path by the script that runs the thing, which means that if you don't use their particular run script and you want to run with something else, then you need to do all that work too. Whereas if you had used our path in the first place, then you would, you would not only have all the information in the libraries, you could also fix it in your executable, and so our compiler wrappers could add it in. But our, we typically deploy like our CC, uh, or our, our compilers and our MPI compilers, so that they add our paths for all the things that you need. We can't do that anymore with OpenMPI without patching the OpenMPI build to, to use run, our paths instead of run paths. And you do that via the compiler wrappers by we do, adding the still enable new details. You add disable new tags, or, or do you? We strip enable new tags or add disable. Well, adding disable is harder because you have to make sure it's the last disable. Just do that at the end. Yeah. 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 So like, yeah, it, it's 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 nasty. We've talked to the um, libc guys about this, about the R path versus run path thing, and they agree that the search semantics are broken. But we would have to introduce like another flag, <laughs> like write path or something, which we could also call R path because it would be write path. So we could have enable new new tags. <laughs> and make it even more sensible. So the, yeah, it's deprecated, they won't get rid of it. Um, yeah, it's, it's, they're, they're not going to get rid of it. And, and it's, it's nice because it overrides LD library path. Um, I mean, on the other hand, if you use a package manager and it inserts all the right run paths and you get the linking right in the first place, then run path can be perfectly sensible and you can override it with LD library path like you expect. The, the issue that we see is yeah. that sometimes users set LD library paths. Yes. And they like hard include user lib64 because that's what Stack Overflow told them to do. Yes. And also commercial software that in their yeah. run scripts they add user lib64 and LD library path and if you're using run path, you're screwed. Yeah. Well, so like the, the cool thing about this is if you, if you are path your executables, like we have people who do workflows with like three different codes and they may have like, you know, three different versions of different libraries that are associated with each of those codes. If you used LD library path or something to set that up, then you would, you would have to make sure that all three codes are synchronized, right? Which is the same kind of problem that the guys who are doing containers are trying to get around. They, the, each application has requirements that there's no point in trying to sync with another application because they're maintained by different people. Like, they, you should just let the applications run with their own dependencies. And so that's what we're doing here. We're doing it as far as we can within, within the same process space because it's, it's one LD.SO. We're not letting you load you know, two different versions of the same library because that's just a race, right? If you have if you have a DAG and this this guy has one version of lib standard C plus plus and this guy is our path to another one, then you're screwed because you, it's a race to see who loads lib standard C plus plus first, and then the next one will be looked up by symbol and you'll get the wrong ABI incompatible symbol from the other. So one. you you still may have conflicts even with our problem. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you you would never have basically like we we force you to have one version of each library in a DAG. 
right. you don't know when you're combining multiple things which one. Yes, if, if you use stack install foo and then you stack install bar, they could have different versions of things. Although we generally wouldn't resolve them unless we had a good reason to resolve them to different things, right? We would take the latest stuff. Yeah, but if you build something last week and you build something today. Yes, that's true. These things may still do that. Yeah, so you may end up, yeah. So I'll talk about that a little bit when I get to concretization. Because that, that's a good point. Yeah, OK. Um, the other thing that we do that may be slightly different is we don't bootstrap the compilers by default. You can build compilers with stack. But um, when you run stack for the first time, if you run stack compilers, it searches your path and it searches your system and tries to find the available compilers. And we've set up a file called compilers.yaml um, with the, the compilers that we found. Um, right now, and, and I'll, you, I'll talk about this more tomorrow, um, compilers are um, a little special. They're not proper dependencies in stack. They're an attribute of the node. And that lets you mix and match compilers. Um, we don't have a dependency model that extends down to things like libstandard C++ or ICC, depending on GCC for its libstandard C++ yet. We're working on getting that in there, um, but it's kind of subtle. Um, what we would like to have that in there so that we could um, you know, allow you to mix and match compilers, but also provide you some guarantees, like you only have one version of libstandard C++ represented in this graph. Um, we don't currently do that. Um, but this, generally, this works pretty well. Most people will build a DAG with one compiler, um, with the exception of build dependencies, which they tend to like to use the easy compiler for, as opposed to the fancy compiler. With mixing and matching compilers, you mean building one thing with one compiler, building another thing with another compiler, yeah, and, and then having that in the same DAG? Yeah, you could say stack install foo percent GCC, and then say build this subtree, like FFTW, with ICC. And, and it would link that for you. Right now you don't. We do have that. We don't guarantee you that you did it right. We, we won't tell you that you used a version of ICC that is too old or something for this version of GCC, and that their lib standard C++ will be ABI incompatible. You're just on your own if you start customizing the compilers too much right now. Um, but we would like to be able to guarantee that. And we're doing that requires bringing the lower level dependencies into the DAG and making sure that they get normalized properly. Is that, is that something that your users do a lot? Like... Um, the one place it comes up, and, and it's currently manual, um, that we would like to make automatic is if you build, like, say, I don't know, Hyper or Trailinos or something big like that, um, people like to build the math library with the, with the fancy compiler. Um, and they like to build the build dependencies with something that the build dependencies actually build with. So if you have to build CMake along with that, there's no point to building CMake with like the Excel compiler because it'll explode because they don't test with the Excel compiler. Um, and so what we're working on is policies for the dependency resolution so that if you have a pure build dependency, we pick the default uh, compiler for the front end or for the, for the login node operating system um, so that it's easy to build that you generally wouldn't use the fancy compiler for the other things. The other place it comes up is, and for the same reason, is on cross-compiled machines, where your logging node is something different from your backend node. And in that case, you really can't build the build dependencies with the backend compiler because you're cross-compiling. And if you try to run the build dependency after you build it, then you it'll it's slow. Um, and so you have to build that with the front end. Right. So um, we have this recursive syntax. Um, we let you constrain the versions of the dependencies. It's kind of cool because if you want to play around with things and you know that you tried to build this once with the Intel compiler and libelf0813, the default, had some problem, you can just say, well, I know it's libelf um, that caused the problem, so I'm going to tell it to build with libelf0812. Um, and that's just a matter of tacking on caret, which just depends on libelf at 0812 to your spec. Um, so the... Um, yeah, the, the cool thing about this syntax is that you don't have to know anything about the structure of the DAG. Because we guarantee you that there's only ever one version of a particular package in a DAG, um, we know that you're talking about that libelf regardless of the structure. So you don't really have to think about um, the fact that, you know, it depends very indirectly on MPI leaks. We'll just say, okay, we'll, we'll put that constraint on there for you. Um, and then finally, the, the other big thing in spec is we have um, support for virtual dependencies. So a package in stack doesn't depend on mpitch or open MPI. It depends on MPI. And then the mpitch and open MPI packages provide the MPI interface. And it can be versioned. So you can have a package that depends on MPI at version 2 or higher. 
if you need the version two of the interface. And then Stack will pick you an MPI implementation that supports that version of the interface. And so um, what that means is that when we actually do dependency resolution for this DAG, the MPI node is going to get swapped out for um, some MPI implementation um, in the course of the, of the resolution. And, um, and then you can actually control which implementation you want to use on the command line. If this is unconstrained, you could say build this thing within Vapage at 1.9. Um, and this, this provides MPI2, but suppose it didn't, and the package depended on MPI2, this would fail and it would tell you there was a constraint violated if it was actually not a sufficiently high MPI version for the package. Um, same thing there, you can say build with open MPI at 1.4 or higher, um, and that just says find me that new of a version of open MPI. And if you really want to be ambiguous, um, people don't typically do this, but you can say stack install MPI leaks with, uh, with MPI2. Um, typically, you don't put this kind of a constraint on the command line. You put this in the package and say, I require MPI2 or higher. How, how does it work when you, when you build or when you install a package? You just tell it this is MPI2 and MPI2.1 and the, the package MPI2. says I provide this version of MPI when I'm at this version and this version of MPI when I'm at this version. You can do ranges. And so there's multiple provide statements in the MPI packages. If you want to see it, clone spec and do spec edit and pitch or spec edit and that pitch. And you can see the provides in there. But it's, it's maybe something to clean up your, your graph rather than people actually use it like the, the bottom example. Uh, they it's prop flexibility because if you do spec install MPI, it knows it needs some MPI too. Yeah. And, yeah. and somewhere else you can specify like I want to. Uh, they, pe people would typically write something like this if they even write the MPI implementation at all. There's a there's a configuration file in spec that says for these platforms we prefer these versions of MPI. The site can say we prefer in or open MPI. Like Livermore would prefer in Vapitch, so we put that in there. Um, and you can control basically how it would resolve that at your site. Um, and so it'll and then if it can't resolve within Vapitch or something. Um, then you can tell it, to, it'll, it'll sail over to something else. And so our second MPI is open MPI, so we'll do that. Um, yeah, people don't generally write this, but it's an example just to show what you could do. And we're not showing packages right now, but this is a constraint that I would put in a package. Okay. Um, and then finally, we have this concretization process, which I think differentiates stack a bit. Um, you can write fairly elaborate specs on the command line. Um, what this is doing is it's providing constraints on a DAG. And so we build that DAG out, and you can see here, this is the graph. We put the constraints on the nodes, um, and we call this an abstract spec because it's not complete. You can't build this. You don't have enough information yet. Um, we have this concretization process, which is basically dependency resolution. Um, the way that most package managers do dependency resolution is that they will have a package and a version, and that's their description of the thing that they're going to resolve to. In SPAC, we have a lot more information because we have the compiler, the compiler version, um, the, the variants that are on these things, like this plus debug option. Um, you can actually depend on a package with an option if you need to. So like if you're a package, you can say, I depend on HDF5 plus parallel, and then you, you know that you need the parallel interface for HDF5. Um, so that's all baked into the dependency resolution algorithm. Um, and once we concretize it, every node gets a version that the, the tool picks. It gets a compiler, a compiler version. Uh, an architecture, um, all the variants are assigned values, so all the different build options, and we call that a concrete spec. And then that gets stored um, as a YAML file on disk, and this is what the database is generated from. And um, if you want to reinstall, you can do an install, stack install dash F, one of those, if you want to build the exact same thing again. Um, yep. So the other thing that we do um, to enable some of this is we build everything in our own compilation environment. I mean, every package manager does this to some extent. Um, the unique thing that we do, or maybe not unique, but what's one of the choices that we've made um, is that we build with compiler wrappers. And so when you get into the stack build environment, um, we take some pains to make sure that um, you will be using the right R paths um, and that you will have the includes and library search paths for your dependencies on the compile line. So what happens is, um, when you go into do install in SPAC, it's going to fork off an install process um, for each dependency. And so each, each one of these guys gets its own process. And because of that, the builds like in, in the actual packages, they're free to set whatever environment variables they want. They have their own little sandbox in that they have their own process. So they're not going to interfere with another build with the things that they set. 
Um, we set up our own custom environment in here in that we set CC, CXX, F77, and FC to our own um, SPAC CCs in the environment. And so um, what this is really doing, and, and this is a little different from what happens today, but these are the compiler wrappers, the SPAC CC, SPAC C++, SPAC F77, and so on. Um, and these are the real compilers in their installation directories, the SPAC CC environment variable. This is going to get invoked. And when this gets invoked, it looks at this environment variable and finds the real compiler and invokes it. And so that, that's how the wrapper works. Um, and the wrapper also um, sets some include library and uh, rpath flags on the command line so that we know um, where to look for dependencies when we search for them at runtime. So that's how the rpaths get in there. Um, the kind of cool thing about this is because we put these i's and l's and, and rpaths on the command line, um, some builds will just work. Um, you don't have to do anything special or add any flags to them um, because auto tools will just try to test if it can include a header or test if it can link against the library and it's just there like it was a system package because we put the dash i's and dash l's. Um, we also set things like package config pass, cmake prefix path, library pass, stuff like that in the build to make it likely that you will find your own dependencies. Um, what we don't do um, at the moment is we're, we're not setting up any kind of cheroot jail or anything like that for the build process, which would give us more reproducibility. Um, it's hard to do that on supercomputers um, because there's just so much vendor stuff that you rely on in the vendor environment, especially like on a Cray where you have to use their compiler wrappers too. Um, it, it, th that we don't we don't do that yet. Yeah, so um, there's that and you need root. Yeah, it, you, there's that and you, you would need root for Cheroot. For total isolation. You can do what Basil and or what Basil and um, Gentoo do, which is use a namespace and, and actually which which you can do in user space, right? Um, and so Gentoo actually has a library um, that we're thinking about using that they use to set up jails for their build processes in user space. And I think that, that would give, is that? Is uh, it, I think it's called Gentoo Jail, like libjail or something. Um, and so I was looking at it for uh, the other day. We haven't gotten around to integrating it, but it would give us a potentially more reproducibility. I think Basil uses that internally. And Debian also has a tool like that. Sorry? Debian also has a tool like that. Yeah. And you can completely do that, that could or it? I think, I haven't, so I haven't researched it enough, but that's my impression. Because Gen 2 prefix doesn't require root. You can install that without. without yeah, it can still be the root binary. So I think Singularity has a whole bunch of yeah. root binaries in back that can use and need use namespaces. Yeah, it, well, I, mean, I think it also depends on the kernel version. Um, yeah, yeah, but it, and, yeah. Yeah. and kernel features that are in yeah. yeah. So it's not something that's universally supported yet, and, and I haven't had a chance to look through it. I would love to have something like that so that we could have more reproducible builds. Um, I would, you would still, even if you did that though on the craze and, and some of the weirder platforms, you would have to think about how to mount in all the different, uh, you know, vendor things. And, and so th there's more complexity there. I would also like it if, um, you know, currently our, in our build environment, we, we blacklist, we don't whitelist. And so um, we will just blow away things like LD library path and variables that we know are bad for the build process. Um, but we don't, um, I'd rather just start from scratch and set all the things that I need so that I know exactly what I'm getting. Um, on the craze and things like that, there are other Cray programming environment variables and so many things going on that like, we, I, don't, I don't want to do that um, because I think everything would break. And, and essentially, that is Cray's interface, right? Like that, that using their compilers and their modules is their interface. So we had to rejigger things for Cray to do that. Um, and, and I think that's the only one that they really support. So if we were to try to do it, you know, natively underneath, they could change it out from under us more easily. So we're trying to go with the most stable thing. Although I sort of, I sort of push back at the notion that anything in the environment based on the shell scripts is the interface. <laughs> All right. So um, I think I talked about this somewhat. Yeah. We we just so this this is the whole reproducibility thing. Um, but you can reproduce and install with spec install dash s spec that. One one thing I would like to be able to do um, is sort of explore this reproducibility notion a little more in depth. Um, I think for HPC, people typically don't want to reproduce exactly what they did before. They want to reproduce something slightly different from what they did before, um, where you know maybe they ran on last year's machine, and um, it has one architecture. And if you just do spec install dash f spec .yaml, you'll get the wrong architecture in the spec because it's from the old machine. And what you'd really like to do is say, you know, I want to take that spec .yaml, but I want to change the compiler to the Intel compiler, and I want to build for Broadwell instead of Haswell, or something like that. 
Um, and, and what would be cool is if we could take that and um, rerun the dependency resolver with the change parameters and see if any conflicts arise and then try to resolve it. Um, we have that logic implemented for um, something resembling, I guess, environments. We, it's like a prototype. We have a, there's a pull request out there where you can basically, you can take a bunch of specs, you can stick them in the same environment and stack will try to resolve them all together. Um, and then you can take that chunk of things and install it. Um, and so uh, Peter has some prototype logic in there for saying, change the compiler to Intel and then recheck and see if any conflicts arise. Um, and I'd like to get to where we actually do a backtracking search to, to fix anything that comes from that. Although at the moment, changing the compiler is fairly trivial. Most things don't have you know, specific changes for, for compilers yet. Um, so there's not that many constraints that depend on it. So it'll just, it'll go smoothly. Um, if you change things like versions, if there's like a version compatibility, it would be good to, you know, pick a newer version of the thing that, you know, satisfies some version constraints. Um, there's, there's a whole resolution process that would need to take place there. Well, one thing that came up last week during the Easy Build User meeting, mm -hmm. that was a bit, it was one of the geeks guys that brought it up. He says, the spec is giving you so much flexibility that you're, you're basically building something that chances are nobody ever built before in terms of the whole tag. That's sort of true, although... And then you will have to do a very good job at testing it to actually make sure it does properly work and doesn't spit out garbage. So what we're doing right now is, so currently SPAC has been, I mean, we're, we're, we're pre-1.0. And um, when you resolve something against develop, um, you're, you're basically, you are probably building something that no one built before, right? Or, or at least, yeah, I think whoever submitted the package, yeah, you, that's probably an accurate statement for, for some of the builds. It's You're, not only that particular package, but everything yeah, else. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that's true. Because we picked the most recent version for lack of a better option, right? There is Well, so there, there is a way to get around that, right? And so what, what we're going for for the release process and what I would like to have is um, we're, we're starting to do monthly releases where we just we push out what we have um, at that time, and then we will backport egregious fixes um, to, to the particular release. Um, for every release, we'd like to have all the packages built and binaries available for those packages. Um, not, not all as in all combinations, right, but all as in I type stack install foo and I build the default configuration of that thing, right? And so if I have all the variations that I need for that to work across the stack um, built, which I don't think is intractable, um, then I can have binaries for that release. And then if, if you then pull down develop, you could say prefer the latest release. Right? And so when you resolve your dependencies, then you will get mostly things that adhere to that release, right? Unless you need these factors. Yeah. And so basically, like, it's, you would snap to the release, essentially, in the, in the resolver, where you would say, I, you know, if that's our latest release, I will prefer those versions because I know they're tested. And we'd have, like, a setting where you could say, go bleeding edge and just build something out of develop or stick to the latest release, which hopefully is fairly recent. And then, you know, the goal, I think, would be to have a nice medium between you have to build exactly what the distro people provided you with, which may not work on your machine or may not, you know, provide you with the flexibility that you want, and you're building something really bleeding edge, right? Like, I'd like to have it so that, you know, the things that you don't care about, you get pretty tested, pretty performant options for, right? And then if you tweak some things, then you're, you know, you're tailor expanding around the, um, the point in the combinatorial space that you, that you care about. So that's what we're going for. Um, and we would also like build everything on every pull request um, where you know, we farm it out for a few different operating systems and we have like some window of developed binaries available. And we'd probably purge those on like you know, least recently used in some time period or something like that. And hopefully you know, that would get you most of the DAG that you care about. Um, and we could also monitor things like what options are people trying to build with, right? Um, if we have a binary mirror and we get requests in for, I want to get this spec, um, we could look at it and say, hey, this is looking really popular. Everyone is trying to build with you know, CUDA or something that we don't have in the default stack. We could go and optimistically um, put the binary out there for that and accelerate things. That's a ways off. We don't have that yet. But I think, I think it's feasible. So publishing binaries, that sounds like a lot of work. Um, yeah. Because, well, most, so you're going to do whatever spec install foo does, but then on which platform, in which OS? Yeah, so we're starting with the platforms in Amazon, and I'd like to do it for all the big machines. So like, I would do it on, on 
Summit and Sierra at Livermore and uh, Theta at Argonne and Corey at NERSC. And so that would cover, um, I don't know how accurately I can extract, I can do binaries for Cray because the plot, because every site is tweaked by their site representative so extensively. Um, we'd have to see about that. But we have talked to Cray about um, containers. And, and so they are saying that they may start publishing a container of the Cray compute environment. In which case, we could use that as our build environment. Publishing in the sense, giving it to their sites, yeah. and then we could have their sites running CI to generate binaries for Cray. Um, and that—that's what I—I I would really like to do that. And then, and then that would be our vanilla environment. Maybe we, you know, try to see if we can pull that container from somewhere when we build this back on a Cray. Um, I don't. It's right now. It's like kind of in limited release beta, or like only to to Cray sites, but. It would be cool if that container was available. I don't know how much licensed stuff is in it, so that, that's really the question. Um, and then there's other questions like how do you build with Intel compilers in the cloud and thing. Although Intel actually they they have um, they, they have licensing provisions that let you build for free in some cases. There's a discussion to compiler. get Intel support on Travis. Yeah. And the last thing I saw there was that Intel gave permission to do it or something. I don't know if it's actually there yet. We've, we've done back and forth with them on this. And for some, I don't think Livermore has some weird exception that doesn't allow us to fall under what, whatever category um, we're supposed to fall under for open source. Yeah. Um, and so there's, there's some ambiguity about the fact that like we get paid to work on SPAC by Livermore. But yeah, that, that, we, we have to pay licenses as well for yeah. that exact reason. Right. So I think their wording is such that it's not helping us. Um, but we, I, I may go back to that once we start having a real binary. But for release. testing spec, that would fall on the open source. I, it's all a matter of how your lawyers read it. Yeah. Right. So yeah, I, I agree. Okay. Um, what do spec packages look like? Um, so this may look somewhat familiar if you've seen a homebrew package. Um, we sort of stole the package format from homebrew, but most people in HPC don't know Ruby, um, so we went with Python for um, the language because we figured that that would get more adoption. And, and I know Python well. I guess I know, I know Ruby well enough. Um, they're templates. So in easy build, you've got your easy block, which is the build method, and then you have your easy configs. Um, I would say if you want to think about how this works, you can think of this back package as all the stuff at the class level is like a fat easy config. It's all the metadata um, that goes along with the package. And the stuff in these methods here, this is your easy block, at least in my understanding of easy build. Um, so the, basically, like at the class level, we have like it depends on libelf, it depends on libdwarf, depends on boost at 142 or higher. Those are constraints on your dependencies, right? These can be, um, these can depend on the version of this packet. You can say depends on boost at 1.42 or higher when I am at this version, or when I'm built with this compiler or something like that, um, or when I have this option enabled. I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, these are the versions that are available right now. It's just version, um, this is a string that you determine, and then um, it knows how to do version comparison. Um, it, we, we do version comparison kind of like RPM does version comparison, because that's, that's where I copied the comparison from when I, when I was doing this the first time. We basically split the version into alphanumeric chunks and then compare it lexicographically by chunk. Um, these are the MD5 hashes of whatever you're going to download. And you may notice that there's only one URL up here. So for nicely formed packages that have fairly well-structured releases um, and release directories, we can extrapolate from this URL to any of these versions. And in fact, like you can say stack install Dynast at like 9.2, and it'll try to construct um, a URL for Dynast 9.2 from what it knows, and go and download that for you. Um, and we can also do like there's a spec check some command. It'll go look at all the URLs it has on hand for a package, and it'll try to download um, any new versions that are available and, and find them out on the internet. It'll tell you about them, and you can just say okay, go download them and check some of them, and then it'll spit out the code that you need to put in here for new versions. Um, if this extrapolation doesn't work for your package, then you may have to put URL equals something in the actual version directive there, and you can override specifically for that version. Um, How do you handle multiple sources for the package? Um, we have mirrors, and so, well, oh, you mean multiple? Multiple source 
tarballs per package. So if you have multiple source tarballs per package, you can do what's called a resource. And so you can say resource, um, and it, also, it takes the same parameters as version does. You can fetch it from git, you can fetch it from subversion, from wherever. Um, and it'll download a separate tarball alongside um, the existing tarball. Look in the docs under resource. There's a lot of options for like, you're gonna download this resource and you're gonna put the directory here and call it this, or you're gonna put the directory outside the package tree, but in the staging area and call it something else. It's fairly involved, but so we do support that. Um, and the, the cool thing is that um, because we support it in the package, um, SPAC knows about all the artifacts that it needs to download um, to build a particular thing. And so we care about this at Livermore because we have multiple networks. We have like, we have our open collaboration network, which has I think about a quarter of our computing power. Um, we have like a small restricted zone in the open side that's it's kind of a development area for more sensitive codes. And then we have the classified side, which I think is like 75% of our, our, our power or in, in flops. Um, but that's air gapped. And so a lot of our developers will have to, they, they type spac mirror create package and it goes and downloads all the, the tarballs and things. It creates a, um, a directory that has all the artifacts for the package and you can just send that over to air gap um, to the other network and then point your instance of spac on the other side to it and it'll fetch from there. And actually when you download, um, every time you download a tarball spec caches it in a directory. That directory is structured the same way as a mirror would be. So you can actually just take your cache directory and ship it over to the other side of the network. And if you fetch the thing before, then it'll, it'll fetch it again on the other side. Um, the install methods, um, essentially you're, you're past the spec for the package. This is that bag that I showed earlier. You can refer to your dependencies, so you can just say spec sub prefix, and there's all sorts of other attributes that you can get off of your dependencies like that. Um, and note that, like, similarly to on the command line when you say depends on libelf at this version, um, you can just say spec sub main, and that gets you um, the, the dependency. You don't have to care about the graph structure or anything in here. You can just ask about your dependencies. Um, the other thing that we, we guarantee you is that between your typing spec install and the time you get into install here, uh, we have concretized the spec for you. And so this graph that you are passed here in install, it has all of the information that you need. And the rationale there is that um, most of the work that people seem to waste time on when they do build scripts is um, searching around the system to figure out if something is available. Um, and, or, or saying, like, does this work, does this work, does this work, does this work? And then you know, the, the build script gets really long and brittle. Um, we, want, we don't want you to have to do any of that work in your install method in SPAC. SPAC should just tell you what to install and you should take the DAG that we give you and translate it into build instructions. And so every, all of these things are basically just constructing a CMake command line. And so here we pass some parameters because for this particular package, putting the dash i's on the command line doesn't, doesn't satisfy it. It really needs the variable. Um, and no system pass equals true. And then we just call yeah, CMake with those arguments and make and make and small. The other thing we can do, um, and only a few packages ended up using this, um, is we can multi-version functions. So most packages will put some conditional logic in the install method, and you can actually use that same syntax to query the spec. So you can say, do you depend on this thing? Is this variant in the spec? Um, is this enabled? Is one of these options set? Um, that's all done through the spec object. Um, you can also overload functions based on the spec object, so you can have this completely different version of install. The place that people typically do this is if the build system just changes for the package. So for Dynance, they used to use auto tools. And so when you're at version um, up to 8.1, or I guess it wasn't auto tools, it was like their own custom thing. You just do configure, make, and make install. And since 8.2, since 8 um, they have improved the build with CMake, and that's why it looks so much prettier here. Um, and see, isn't, isn't this better than this? <laughs> And so for all the, we, the default version is to, to just make the CMake command line for newer versions of Dynance. Okay. Do you have to do that on a method level? You don't. So you could, you could put an if statement. Yeah. yeah, you could just put an if statement in the function too. Right. It's, a, it's a style thing. Yeah. Um, if, it makes, if, it's, if it's cleaner to just do this, which, you know, because the, the commands are different, right? the structure's different. But the um, configure line is different. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, then you, you can separate it out completely the method level. Right. You don't have to. You can do all the same conditionals inside the function too. Mm -hmm. um, can you, how hard is that version lock to, to can easily say 
below version 5 to this, above version 5 to that, or if it's range version? You could say that at 5, colon 8. Or okay. so. Yeah. Or at 5, colon 8.2. So, when people change something, how do the pull requests look like? Do they just update versions so they actually add more of these decorated stuff? A lot of pull requests are just an extra version like this, and they don't even include a, a new URL, which is kind of cool because it makes it easy to say, oh, you're fetching from the same site, so it's very easy for us to um, approve pull requests for new versions. Do you also clean up old versions? Yeah, some people, well, we, so currently we try not to remove the old versions unless they go away. I'd like to have some automation around that to, to verify that they're still available, although I, I would not, um, we're planning on archiving the source tarballs for things and just continuing to host them in S3 so that people can reproduce older versions at least to a point, and we would have to set up a policy for that. So for that reason, I guess I would just, we tend to just keep the old version um, because even if you take it out um, and this URL is broken for that older version, um, someone might have a mirror, right? Yeah, sure. Well, I, I wasn't asking yeah. because stuff disappears. I was asking because, and we have the same issue in Easybox. Yeah. The logic may get quite involved. Oh, for older versions? Yeah, if you have 10 years oh. worth of software versions, you'll yeah. have configure, make, make, install, CMake, Basel, That's true. whatever the next thing is. Yeah. yeah. Well, so we were thinking of providing the option to split the files, like so that you could you could potentially have a package file for older versions and newer versions, and then minutes. you could name the package file with the version range that it's yeah. valid for, or something like that. Have the same idea, but we haven't gone there. It, it would be relatively easy for us to do that. Um, the the way that stack packages get loaded is there's there's a directory. Uh, we made a custom Python importer, and so like basically like if you you can import every package in stack. So one package can import another if you want to. You can say from spec.package.builtin. Um, you know, mpitch, import the mpitch class. We have the same thing. And you can subclass a package that way. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, if 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 you do that, then you know we could just modify our importer so that it would um, check the version one first. We'd we'd have to make like a composite class that would do something different. Basically, like. The package is an installer when instantiated, but when it's the, the class is the metadata and the instance is the installer. Mm -hmm. um, we would have to make the instance composite so that it would know which version to instantiate underneath to install the particular thing. Do you guys do multiple inheritance too? So, so for example, at least with the old diamonds, this is just configure me. Um, yes. Do we do that? Do you have like generic packages that? We do. Okay. So yeah, so if you look in the build systems directory in stack, we have support for um, Autotool, CMake, Python packages, and R, WAF. <laughs> so, so why does Dynamics derive from Autotools? Uh, so it, because it's hybrid. So we don't, yeah, we haven't, so that's a good question. We don't have multiple inheritance done well yet because the build system packages make a lot of assumptions about their build system. So if you want to make a package that does both things like this package, you just extend package, and you have to do some of the mechanics yourself. So you may be missing a few features here. That's something we do have. Yeah. You can do, well, do Does it all factor to derive from all the tools and CMake, and then depending on the version, we do the rest. Yeah. And there's no like configure, make, make, install in there, it just calls to the. We could, yeah. yeah. We could probably refine that somewhat. Because that would clean this up a bit. A little bit. Yeah. It's also not the cleanest easy blocks we have. Are the ones that do that? <laughs> I think it doesn't, depending how big this grows, and what yes. this, this is not the common case. Like, so we haven't, we haven't spent a lot of time on the hybrid builds because there aren't that many packages that, that need it. Well, there's more and more stuff that used to do other tools that's moving to see me. Yeah, that's true. But that's the main thing. Yeah. So I, I'd like to make the multiple inheritance cleaner. Um, it did take some, uh, it, so, You'll, you'll notice that like this is a this is we we implemented a custom DSL for this, so like this, it this function modifies the class. So like there's there's some fanciness going on here, um, the, and it's actually kind of cool that it supports inheritance at all. Um, and so yeah. jiggering that correctly was, so was interesting. It more these these are it basically when it defines the package, these are all evaluated lazily. So like we'll we'll store up all the things that need to happen for the package, and then when it finally gets instantiated, we go through and put all the attributes on it. 
Um, so I, I don't think multiple inheritance would be that hard to do. I just I haven't tested it. Yeah. yeah. Um, is it runs on as lazy? Sorry. Well, well, the function the function that runs, but it doesn't do much. There's a function so that runs on the issue. So if you have multiple inheritance with something else, that also claims depends on say on a boost version. They would have. So you'd have to make sure that the meta class was handling both of the situations. So this this stuff is actually put together in the meta class. So if you really if you want to get into it, I don't I don't want to get too far into those details here because it will yeah. take me forever. But um, but there is some cool stuff there. Um, even for um, yeah. So I, I'm not showing it here, but there's a patch directive. You can say patch this package when it's in a particular version. Um, and we added the ability to depend on something with patches. And so when you do that, you can say depends on you know spec patches equals list of patch directives, where the patch directives are actually passed into another directive. And then we have to make sure that the internal directive doesn't get attached to the flash. So there's all kinds of fanciness that goes on there. Um, all right, so writing the packages. Um, I think we talked a lot about this already. Um, we're currently using MB5 for these. I think uh, we're going to move to SHA-256 soon. Um, oh yeah, variants. We haven't talked about variants. So, you can def in the package, you can define build options. And so here, um, you have a variant called MPI. You can set the default value for it. And you can say that this is a description that's shown on the command line. If someone says spec info package, then they'll see all the available variants and what the options are for them. Um, complex, HDF5, um, all of these things are just options that'll go on the package. You can actually, these are Boolean, but you don't have to make them Boolean. You can have multi-valued variants now. That's a new feature in 0.11. Um, where you can say here are the legal options for this, or you could have diff you could have network interface equals, and then have all the different optional drivers for things. So we do that for the MPI packages, um, or you could have an int valued variant. So you can have like box live um, built with two uh, D or three D versions. Um, and for any of those variants, other packages can depend on you with them. And so you can say I depend on box live dims equal two. Um, where the dims is the dimension variant, and I just depend on the two-dimensional version of that library. Um, this is just saying I depend on plus, this is the Python dependency, and then down here, this is an optional dependency. And so you can depend on something, and here we're depending on this virtual MPI package, um, when the MPI option is enabled. And so if someone wants to install this package without MPI, they would say install petsy tilde MPI, and the tilde just says turn off the MPI variant. So you can put this when on most of the directives and, and make them conditional. And so that's one way that we make it so that you can cram all this stuff into one package. Um, okay, we talked about this a little bit already with the Dynance package. So, so, so yeah. can you go two slides back? Here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you test, or when you, when, when you test, for example, Betsy, do yeah. you test all the possible combinations? We or? tend to test just the default. Um, but in, in, and honestly, like we're in the process of setting up testing infrastructure. So um, which variants we would test is a good question, and, and we ought to pick you know some slices of the space. Um, we probably wouldn't test just install Petsy for for Petsy. We'd probably test it with and without MPI or something like that, or maybe with a few different compilers. Um, but we haven't decided all the different options. And so what we might end up doing is, you know, the, we could put some extra directives in the package that say, um, here are the axes that you should test on, right? Or here's, here are some default test specs for this package where you would just put Petsy plus MPI, Petsy minus MPI, Petsy plus MPI plus something else. Could you could do that here? You could stick that up at the top and make it just an attribute of the package. And then if we test that, that could be the recommended testing. Or we could put it in an external YAML file or something. Um, but yeah, I, I've thought about how we would do that. Um, and I mean, obviously we can't test all the combinations. Because if I, I mean, once we get the new concretizer in here, we'll be able to like enumerate the combinations as back packages if we, if we really, really want to. But there's, I mean, there's gonna be like thousands of them. So I don't think we could do, you know, all the combinations of every package. But I think we could certainly choose the common ones that people would run into and claim that that is a reasonable testing surface. Okay, so um, 
Don, we should try and wrap up. Okay. A lot of us lunch is going to be. Oh, yeah. All right. So um, creating packages in SPAC, um, you can say SPAC create and pass it a URL, and it will generate you a boilerplate. Um, we handle the different build systems there. So if you pass it a, build, a CMake package, it'll generate you a CMake package template. If you pass it an auto tools package, it'll generate you an auto tools template. Um, and the idea is that most of the stuff is done for you. Um, so we try to make it very easy for people to contribute packages that way. Um, all right. This is the reinforced the end here. We just released SPAC 0.11. Um, and Kenneth was nice enough to find a performance problem with it, so we patched that and released 0.11.1. Um, and so that has 2178 packages. Um, the big major features are the binary packaging that we've talked about a bit. We support Python 3 throughout. Um, we have some really cool module support, so if you, if you guys are interested in that, check out the YAML format that you use to specify module hierarchies, because it's very versatile. The guys at EPFL did that. Um, and basically, like, I guess I'll say this. With the spec LMOD generator, you can put a YAML file, and basically in the YAML file, you say the virtual dependencies that you want to put in your hierarchy. And so you can, it, it plus compilers. So you can have you know, a typical LMOD hierarchy that has core, compiler, MPI, um, and it'll just use the MPI implementations there for the, um, for the different MPI packages that you could load. You can also say core, compiler, MPI, and lot pack. And it will just it will throw in another level for the LotPack implementation for the packages that actually depend on LotPack as a virtual dependency. Um, same for BLOS. You could even put JPEG in your hierarchy if you wanted to. Python. Um, that's so we don't currently switch on like version that way. So you can you can stick any virtual dependency in there right now, but Python's not a virtual dependency. It's just a package, and so that's a good idea. <laughs> And let's see. Yeah, we, we added multi-value variants, um, test dependencies, and some other dependency things. One interesting thing we added was packages can now patch their dependencies. So packages can already patch themselves, um, but we have QMC pack and that we, we tried to integrate. And those guys, for some reason, maintain like a 40,000 line patch on one of their dependencies, um, which is weird. Um, but, but they do it, and they wanted to be in stack. And so we, we said, well, we could support that. Um, so you can depend on a package with a patch. And, and what that means is that when you build that package, um, or when, when that package is built as your dependency, then we will patch it and we will give it a different hash because we put the actual hash of the patch into the spec. So it's basically you, you're installing a custom version for yourself alongside all the others, and it will coexist with the regular vanilla version that everyone else depends on. Um, and so you know we don't condone that. We're not saying please everyone go patch your dependencies. But if you're a package that does, and there's a fair number of them, um, we can at least bring you into the ecosystem and maybe advise you to stop doing that or understand why it is that you did that. We can, we can encode that. Um, and then lots of speed improvements were in there. OK. Um, we're collaborating pretty closely with the US Exascale program. Um, and as part of this, I think you know, the main points here are that we're trying to improve on the dependency model to add more things all the time. Um, so we're adding this new concretizer to, to make the dependency resolution better. Um, we're trying to be a hub for software releases for ECP, so we've been working with different teams under ECP to, to have them do releases periodically and do the releases using the stack. Um, and then we want to do build and test automation. So the big thing for this year that, we're, that we want to have done by September is the environment stuff that I talked about earlier and the build and test infrastructure. So we want to have automated tests running all the time. And we're working with Kitware uh, to do that. Um, and we, we're also planning on hosting binaries, like I said. So that's all happening this year. Um, there's a concurrent project that you may be interested in, which is we're doing continuous integration with the ECP. So we're working with the HPC centers to build a secure CI system. Um, maybe we can talk about that at lunch. Um, but essentially, like, it, it's a, the, most CI systems are not designed for HPC centers, and you can't run them securely, or at least not as a service for users. And we're trying to change that. Um, We've worked with a lot of different projects under ECP, and we'll get into the details. Um, this one in particular may be interesting because it includes all the major solver libraries from DOE. So XSDK is the distribution for, for Trilinos, Petsy, Hyper, SuperLU, and some others. Um, and then this is the patching stuff I've already talked about. The community is growing. Um, you can see that like in 2015, we were mostly a Livermore project. And so that's this green line here and the blue line down here. This is lines of code over time in the packages under spec by organization. And this is lines of code over time in the core by organization. And so like around 2015, when we gave a presentation at supercomputing, we started getting lots of external contributions. And it's just kind of grown since then to the point where like in the packages, Livermore isn't actually the major contributor anymore. Argon with Adam Stewart has 
way more package contributions now um, than, than anyone else. And so it's, it's been pretty awesome to receive so many contributions. Um, and then sometimes the people will even add things. So like the ECP proxy application team was trying to you know, have a way to differentiate their proxy apps from other packages. So someone at EPFL just added tagging to support that that day. So you can, you can actually search by tags in SPAC and packages can have a tags attribute so that you can just, you can provide a little more metadata. Um, okay, and this is my last slide. The next steps, um, what we're working on right now is like I said, the environment support. So we wanna support environments kinda like Conda or like Nix profiles. Um, and also the way that say, um, if you use pipend or bundler or something like that, we wanna have better dependency resolution for developers. So we'd like you to be able to clone a repo and it had a stack file.yaml in the root that says I depend on this, 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 and this. And then you would just type stack install in there and it would build you like a little prefix or something or maybe it would just install the packages that you need and give you an environment that you can then pop into that would have all those packages in a single prefix. Um, implementing that has been fun. Um, it's, it's almost done. Um, and so I think you can expect that in a, in a version pretty soon. Um, we're building the infrastructure for binary distribution. I'm going to talk about that at FOSS demo a little more. Um, and we're building a new concretizer to support things like the um, better compiler dependencies and the better backtracking uh, that I talked about earlier. So that's it. Thanks. Any questions? All right. How many FTE do you think are working on core? On core? It's, it's hard to say. I mean, so there's me, um, but I'm not full time by any means at the moment. Um, we have two half people at Livermore um, who are who are dedicated to stack. They're they're newer, uh, so they're you know maybe two or three years out of undergrad. Um, and then Massimiliano at EPFL has has helped a lot on core. And then occasionally we just we get people who come in and just add things to core. So it's kind of you know we get drive by contributions sometimes. It's almost like two FTE. Yeah, I, and then you know we're trying to expand that. We have we have a Kitware subcontract for about an FTE now. Um, they're going to be focusing on the binary distribution stuff. Um, so so there's that. We, we piece it together from all sorts of different places. What is Kitware? Kitware is uh, you know CMake <laughs> and BTK. It's a company. They do a lot of contracting for DOE. Okay. Yeah, yeah Paraview. Paraview yeah. Paraview is one of the big tools. Yeah. So how, how is that going? Um, it's going. It's going well. So like they contributed dependency types earlier. So one of their engineers added the, the ability to have different dependencies. When you say it's limited, you pay them to do it. We pay them to do it. Yeah. So I, we pay for some contributions. We we try to get FTEs any way we can because our overheads are fairly high. In, in Department of Energy, and so if we outsource things, then we can we can pay less. But then we run the risk that you know they don't understand our domain that well. But that's not the case with Kitware; they know um, HPC very well. Um, and the other kind of cool thing that that does is it gets the actual pair of you developers thinking about maybe using SPAC as their distribution mechanism, which I think can help us. And because they have so many connections to other HPC sites, we're trying to you know get them to promote it in, in other places too. Um, and then the other thing is under ECP, because we're gonna be using this for um, testing the whole ECP software stack, I think we'll get an influx of, of contributions that way. Um, because there's a whole area within the Exascale, pro Exascale project for integration. And um, that includes the continuous integration stuff that I was talking about. It includes testing stack packages and doing releases. It also includes um, like 1.5 FTE per facility for integration work. And so we may be able to work with the facilities to say, you know, hire someone who can do DevOps stuff for ECP, who can do stack integration, who can help with at least the packaging side of things. And I'd like to parlay some of those people into core contributors too. Um, and we'll see, you know, how it goes. It's hard to find people who have all the skills to work on both like contributing to a package manager and work understanding HPC software to the degree that they need to for, for something like this. All right. Yeah, we can discuss it further over lunch, I guess. That would be a good time to get there. So we can get a table. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Are you going to look up here? Yeah. Great. Thanks. Oh, yeah. Hey, there's stickers. stickers. There's like there's stickers up here. So take some stickers.